Good evening and welcome to another edition of Down to the Wire. I'm your host, Derbyologist, and joining me again this week is co-host Candace Hare, capping with Candace. Candace, this week we're going to make it a slate of Saratoga races. We're going to have a couple of races from Saturday and then the CCA Oaks, which is on Sunday and drew a very competitive field. First off, the Stanford, one of the first major baby races of the year for juveniles. And what's interesting about this race is we bring in some horses from Churchill Downs and Monmouth and Belmont, and they kind of all meet uh, in upstate New York. They do. I was glad this year we got a pretty big field of 11 horses here. And I think it's fun, too, that we get to see some of the horses by some of the new sires. We have Trilling Cinnamon here, so who's by Trilling Candy, and Uncle Vinny is by Uncle Mo. So... A little bit of new blood into the mix as well. Um, I think this is a very competitive race, but ultimately I landed on the Proven Horse. He's coming in hot. He won the Bench for Manor at Churchill Downs leading into this race. That was over this distance of six furlongs, which is a distance that many of these horses have never tried. And not only have they never tried it, if you look in the work tabs, a lot of horses have never even worked this far, let alone raced this far. So something to keep an eye on when you're handicapping the race, but he's coming and has won over this trip. Um, Calhoun doesn't, hasn't done particularly amazing at Saratoga, but he does do very well with these types as far as being two-year-olds who've won last time out. He wins at a very high percentage with those types, and he's by Early Flyer, who gets some very nice two-year-olds, a lot of precocity on that side of the pedigree, and his dam brings some more precocity as well. So several Sprinting influences several precocious two-year-old influences in his pedigree. And even though he comes in here, you know, the big grade three winner, he's not favored on the morning line. And I don't expect him to be favored in the race with the Pletcher horse, Uncle Vinny in here. Cocked and loaded is a very popular pick I've seen among experts but for Larry Ravelli. So he'll both take a fair bit of money in here. I wouldn't be surprised if Payne's Prairie for Steve Asmussen took some money as well. So I think four or five to one is very possible on He's Coming in Hot, which isn't something you normally see with a horse of his kind of resume and pedigree heading into a race like this where so many horses are very lightly raced and very unproven. Um, you know, perhaps what people are concerned about with him is that his wins have been in front-running fashion, and there's a lot of speed in here, but to be honest, for a six furlong or, you know, sprinting juvenile races, that's not something I tend to worry about a lot, because just so often you see whoever breaks on top wins. We can project fast paces all day, but with inexperienced horses like these type, very often it's just whoever gets out in front ends up winning the race. So I wouldn't be too, too worried about the pace and thinking pace meltdown and the like. So I'm going to go with number six. He's coming in hot. A lot of different directions you can go in this race. I do worry about a possible pace meltdown in the race just because I think there is some horses that are going to be sent pretty hard, especially with Uncle Vinny having that outside post. Uh, I'm a little worried, though, that even after the bad start in that last race and he had to check a couple of times, he never really ran a step that day. Now, he's had a couple of works since then. Maybe something was just up. I, I do have a hint. Maybe he had a little bit of that virus that was going around the barn at the time mm -hmm. just because he didn't run a step, and he, he was so well-meant and so well-bet in his debut that you could go that way. And from the outside post, I really think they only have one option, which is to gun. I was impressed with the Ellis Park shipper, John Q. Q. Public. I think that was totally a make sure that we get the victory type win at Ellis Park rather than going to Churchill Downs, running into a monster, and then losing, and then not having him ready for Saratoga. Lucas, in his heyday, always pointed for the Stanford and the hopeful. And so I think this is his best horse of his uh, early precautious type. And so I think this horse is definitely well meant. The Monmouth shipper is kind of interesting. Um, I thought he looked good. You know, Cotton Loaded, he's a small horse. He won that last race. I, I assume he's going to run his race, but I don't see him as a major play at low odds. I guess I would need four or five to one. I do, I'm kind of anti against I'm coming in hot just because. I was really down on the quality of those last two races of his, and I do see him as a total need-to-lead type, a total Texas-bred early flyer. Let's try to get as much money won as we can early on. 
So if there's anybody that's really good in this race, I think they can beat them. But on the other hand, five to one, and maybe there's just a bunch of mediocre horses, and, and you can argue that he's just better than, he's probably break out of the gate. Maybe Uncle Vinny, maybe a little over the top already, already even this early in his career. So definitely could see you going many different ways. I thought Awesome Slew ran a good race as well at uh, Monmouth. He uh, is from Live Oak Plantation. Definitely has a pedigree with Awesome again and seeking the gold. And the last three, four years, uh, Live Oak Plantation has made more of a concerted effort to buy some colts in that two hundred dollars to $400,000 range. Uh, definitely looking for that derby type of pedigree. Uh, so I think he's definitely one to follow whether or not he's ready for the Sanford. But lots of different directions to go. I do anticipate a bunch of horses being sent to the lead and could just kind of be a scrum at the end. One more thing I want to mention with Heath coming in hot is that some of his form has already stood up. The horses he beat, like tap it in the hole. If you win, you get more. Of course, Acapulco, who won at Royal Ascot. So he has had some horses who've come back to win straight away. Obviously, he's ran a few more times, so we've had some time to see how the form of some of his races has shook out, whereas others, we haven't had that chance yet. The other horse I really want to mention here is Twirling Cinnamon, who comes in here for freshman sour Twirling Candy. Another horse who, you know, really is bred to win early. Of course, Twirling Candy won his only start as a two-year-old. And, you know, Twirling Cinnamon is another one who his a form has already stood up fairly well with Range Rider and Air, Amer Air America, both of whom he beat, and they came to win next time out. Um, his dam, Cinnamon Charlie, also... She ran th three times as a two-year-old, and she won all of them, including winning by four and a quarter lengths in the Pin Oaks and Hildang Stakes at Laurel. So lots of precocity in this pedigree as well. Perhaps the one thing I would be concerned about is that Trilling Cinnamon's trainer, Brad Cox, um, with two-year-olds who have won last time out, he struggled a bit in the last five years, only having won one of those ten starts. So, you know, we'll have to see how he does here with the horse who when Nick first him out, if he can replicate that sort of an effort. It's also going to be interesting, I think, to see both him and Uncle Vinny, both by freshman stallions. I think both you and I are in agreement that a lot of these horses who are by, you know, these higher profile freshman stallions are very, very well meant in their first race. So it will be interesting to see if they can replicate those types of efforts second or third time out, or if they were just extremely primed for that first race and maybe naturally regress off of that effort. Yeah, I think Twirling Cinnamon and Uncle Vinny were both not only, I think they were the first winner for both sires. Yeah. So I'm always leery of that because the first thing they want to do is get a winner and then put a big ad on Blood Horse. And so I always question those horses that when you just know they were meant to win that first race, mm -hmm. sometimes they just, that's what they want. That's literally the advertising is, just get that first winner, get it as soon as possible, get it out there in the limelight. So that that's kind of a negative for me, but it is interesting. I, I do think actually Twirling Cinnamon has, has a much better pedigree and yes. you know could actually develop into something. Uncle Vinny, I'm a little worried, but I will give him the benefit of the doubt just because the barn had a horrendous couple of weeks there. And so maybe if he had that virus, um, I just may have miscast him in that second race because he just floundered. I mean... Yeah. He checked, and yeah, he was blocked, but he, he didn't do any running early, middle, or late. So mm -hmm. something was wrong that day, but sometimes they just regress off those big wins, too. Yeah. The Diana race is right after the Stanford. It's a grade one at Saratoga. You can expect a strong field, and that's what we get this year. And some of our top horses, where I, I think down the road we'll see two or three of these horses in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf. I'm pretty excited about this race because I'm very against Tappan who always takes money, and even more so lately, with her having won a few times recently. So it's the race I'm looking forward to. I can't blame them for putting her in this spot, though. She's a tough horse. I don't know what you would do with her, because if you think the end goal would be Breeder's Cap, well, she's a miler, really, and I certainly wouldn't want to put her against the boys in that race. So, you know, maybe try to stretch her out and put her with the fillies in the longer race. So don't blame them for putting her in the spot, even if I don't think she'll stay the trip at all. Um, Stephanie's Kitten comes back here. Stephanie's Kitten I thought was very good last time out, but did run much better than people gave her credit for, being very far back off of what was an extremely slow pace, um, was wide throughout as well. So 
I thought for her to only finish a length back there was much better than anyone was really giving her credit for. That was also her first effort off of a 90 day layoff. You'd only expect her to improve off of that. Um, she will loom the big danger here at, at lower odds. I wouldn't play her to win, but I think, you know, in any, if you're, you know, late pick fours or things of that nature, she's obviously a must use horse in this sort of a spot. Um, my main choice in here is going to be Lady Lara. I've tipped her many a time. She's a horse who, you know, I've kind of been waiting for that big effort from, but I do think this stretch out and trip is what she's been wanting. The last couple races, she's had some pretty brutal luck and trip. So if you watch both her distaff mile at Churchill and her Justa game, I think you can find plenty of excuses. In the Justa game in particular, she was only one and three quarter lengths back, and I thought she just had an absolutely brutal trip caught alongside the rail there. So, um, not only has she had, you know, not had some luck in running recently, but this stretch out and trip should certainly help for her. The last time that she ran this sort of a distance, she was third place behind Custom Cut and Trade Storm, both who are group quality horses overseas. Custom Cut, especially, and Trade Storm, we saw him, he came out here and won the Woodbine Mile as well. So, both horses who on their day are very good ones, so can't blame her for finishing third behind the two boys in that sort of a spot. So I do think the stretch on trip's good for her. I also think the, the smaller field is good for her just because she has had so much bad luck lately that I think it's sometimes horses who've had, you know, some poor luck in large fields, you get them in a small field and they kind of flourish. So I do think the small field helps her as well. Um, the other horse who I would use in this race is hard not to like. I have a feeling she might drift up in price because her big win this year came in California, but she's not just a California horse. She obviously has run well at Keeneland, at Tampa, at Gulfstream as well, so she doesn't fit into the group of the California shippers because she shipped from here to there and kind of took advantage of a very nice trip to win. The form's already been flattered. Fanicola, who she beat there, came back to win a uh, group three race straight away. So those are the, be the three that I'd be looking to use, and... I think you could get away with using those three in here because Teppin will be short and I don't like her and my Miss Sophia will be short too and I don't really like her much in this spot either. I thought that she did run well in her turf debut but I also question the quality of opponent she was against. This is much tougher so I wouldn't want her at any sort of a very short price in this spot as well. So I'm going to take Lady Laura on top. We'll also use Stephanie's Kitten and Hard to Like. This is one of the few times you get a seven horse field with really no throw outs. I thought all seven of these horses were grade one, grade two quality. Mm -hmm. Lots of, you know, Stephanie's kitten, granted the pace was slow the last time, but it, if you look at her last five, six races, doesn't it seem like now she's kind of at a point where she's not bringing that grade one A game every race? Not to say that she can't win, it just seems like she's had a couple you start having more and more excuses, and it just seems like for a while there she was a machine, and now she seems to have a little bit of the excuses going on. Um, yes and no. I think I do think that her style inherently, you're going to have more excuses, especially because she runs a lot in New York, and just a lot of those races for some reason tend to be very slow. So I wouldn't say that she's out form or anything. I mean, in her last one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven races. She's only finished worse than second one time. That was the last time out. So she always, I think, gives a pretty honest effort. So I, I don't think that she's off form or, you know, isn't what she used to be by any means. Yeah, I thought, you know, I just think that she's not throwing down those monster speed figures anymore. I ended up going with my Miss Sophia. Granted, the field she beat was nothing the last time, but this horse is a totally different horse than when the previous trainer had it, and Bill Mott excels with getting a horse like this ready for the turf. Um, he is one of the few trainers where, I mean, yeah, he, he always wants that allowance win before he'll throw a horse into a grade one race. So when, you know, he takes horses like this and some other horses, and, and, and he'll give them that, that little bit of a class drop because he wants to go into these races off a win and not just get them trounced multiple times. I do like Lady Lara. I think she's kind of due for a a better trip, as you say. Uh, I, I think hard not to like is going to float up in odds. So those would be the three that I'd be considering. I'm going to go with my Miss Sophia on top, uh, but I do think Lady Lara and hard not to like may be the better plays. Uh, I'm definitely anti against Teppin, uh, but the pace of the race is 
really going to be a factor here because I think it, it could help both Teppan and my Miss Sophia, and, and it could hurt a uh, uh, kitten again, Stephanie's kitten. Yeah, it's so weird because we had a similar scenario to the last time Stephanie's kitten ran where kitten's queen was entered and everyone said, oh, here's Stephanie's kitten's pacemaker. And she went very slow. <laughs> she was the worst pacemaker of all time. And here she is back again. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know if they maybe try to push this horse, if it, if it can go faster. It just seems a really weird spot. So people, again, are saying, here's Kitten's Queen again, Stephanie's Kitten's pacemaker. But I don't think she's anywhere near fast enough to keep up with Teppin and my Miss Sophia. Yeah, and there's a difference between a rabbit and a pacemaker. And she's not a rabbit. She no. may be a pacemaker, but she's not a rabbit. And if they're starting to think Stephanie's kitten needs a rabbit, well, then that kind of tells me a little bit too that something's wrong with her speed because well, she used to not eat rabbits. It is something that they've that they've been doing lately, though. They've been putting pacemakers in for Big Blue Kitten as well, and he's in very good form. So I think maybe it's just tactics that they're getting onto with some of their bigger horses when they really want them to win. Well, we will see who. Uh, Kind of takes divisional lead in that race. And then on Sunday, we got the grade one CCA Oaks. Uh, Three-year-old fillies, this division this year has just basically been a take turns division. And uh, we saw a couple weeks ago a long shot won the uh, last uh, filly race for three-year-olds. This one's got a bunch of horses that are capable. And again, you could go different directions based on how you foresee the trip playing out in this race. You could. I mean, the horse you mentioned, Keen Pauline, was... You know, a huge price when she won, and the Black Eyed Susans um, obviously benefited from an extremely slow pace, gate to wire effort there. Don't foresee her getting that sort of, same sort of a trip this time out, and you can make, a, I think, a very strong argument that Include Betty, who finished second in there, was much, much the best in that race. The way she closed from very far out of it into those slow fractions and over what was a very front running by a surface that day she was a, certainly the best in there and she showed it when she came back out then and won the mother goose very easily by three and a quarter lengths she's a serious horse i think she's very much the leader of this three-year-old fillies division at least on the east coast if not nationwide and you know i think if there's any sort of a concern maybe it's the smile on an eighth trip but I do think that, you know, she does seem to be the horse among this group who really is training forwardly, and the one who I'd want to use in the spot, I, she should be, to me, include Betty in this race, should be a heavy favorite, and I'm not sure she will be because Carolina is in here, and Carolina seems to be the it horse, the horse that everybody likes and everybody thinks is really good, and she's going to come in here trying a mile on Nate, and I haven't seen that Curlin is some serious stamina influence, but because of Palace Mellis, who had a lot of stamina underneath in his pedigree, people tend to just associate him as a major stamina influence, so I think people will just assume that Curlina stays this trip. I'm not necessarily sure that she does, or, or I certainly wouldn't want to take her over this trip at a very short price when Included Betty is more proven over it. So... I think we can get a square price on Include Betty with the presence of Carolina in here. And my play in here is just going to be Include Betty, Cold, Exacta over a Chide. I'm really intrigued by this horse. It's only ran four times, and I thought it ran pretty well. And it hit her first attempt at Grade Stakes Company, and the Mother Goose finished third in there. Three and a quarter lengths behind Include Betty. She also closed from very far out of it. Was wide several times. Didn't have the cleanest of trips, but still continued on, which... I think it's what you always want to see from, you know, fairly inexperienced horse, especially at that level. So she took a big step up, speed figures wise, from her prior efforts to that one. So we'll see if she can replicate it or if she kind of bounces off that effort. But I do think she's an interesting lightly raised type, and the pedigree is blame out of an AP Indy mare. So not too worried about the trip so much with her. So I'm gonna just play include Betty to win, and then in a cold exact over Chide. Yeah, Carolina is going to definitely be the favorite in this race. I thought the Acorn trip, while troubled, everybody saw it. And I think it actually helped her a little bit at the beginning because there were so many horses hampered at the start. And on the turn, there was a lot of traffic trouble. And she managed to avoid uh, getting 
especially on the turn when she was making her move, it was an impressive late move. And, and But I, I agree. I don't think she's a nine furlong horse automatically just because of her pedigree. She's still lightly raced. And the Acorn had a slow final quarter. So I'm not so sure she's this monster stretch out horse that a lot of people are going to better. I thought Include Betty took advantage of the fast pace the last time. Total pace meltdown. I, I just think it looks a lot better visually on paper than, than the race shape showed. Um, I think Wonder Gal is the best horse in America, not a graded stakes winner. And it just confounds the hell out of me that a horse like uh, the Splash Tastic horse from Saratoga, I'm a condo is a three-time stakes winner, and Wonder Gal can't pick up one of them. So I'm going with Wonder Gal. I think she's long overdue. I think she's one of the better horses in this crop, and I'm going to give her one more shot. But I, I think she's going to – I thought she had trouble trip the last time, ran between horses, and really just got kind of the, the short end late. I thought a horse lugged in on her a little bit, or she could have won that acorn as well. So I'm going with Wonder Gal. I do think uh, I'm a chatterbox is being pointed for a pretty big fall campaign. Uh, Larry Jones rides him in the morning, so I know this horse will be in shape. I've always thought this is a much better horse than the Oaks winner. I thought she ran a better race in the Oaks. I, I, I have no idea why they went all the way back and just lollygagged around and she ran late. But I do think she's a capable horse, and I expect a big fall campaign out of I'm a Chatterbox. So I'm going too deep. I'm using Wonder Gale and I'm a Chatterbox. I think they're both capable of winning. Uh, so those are the two that I like. And, and I think uh, after this race, we'll have a lot clear-cut look at the division and, and hopefully moving here forward. I think these horses are capable running in the older division because I don't see anything in the older division to stop these three-year-old fillies as well. Uh, I think somebody's bound to pick up the pace and, and get a little bit uh, brave, and, and I think one of those two might be the ones. But it could be Carolina just because she's got a little bit of upside. Um, dare I say it, Danette, now that she actually got the win, is actually a little bit dangerous here because – She's a spitting image. They, they placed her overhead all those times. Now that she finally got the win, she's already got the class. So mm -hmm. she's just going to stretch right out in distance and do her thing. And so Danette is live. It's just I'm not picking her to win. Yeah, I, guess, I think it says something about the race when you and I both pick two horses and there's no other overlap. We, we took up half the field here. But um, I'm a chatterbox. She was obviously so good leading up to the Kentucky Oaks. It seemed like all she did was win. Um, her Kentucky Oaks, I, she ran better than I expected her to. Um, her running style to me is, was very indicative of her stamina ability over this trip. I think, you know, I really questioned her ability to stay a mile and an eighth, which is why I ultimately didn't use her in the Oaks. But she ran very well, but I do think them pulling her back as far as they did in there tells me that they also were perhaps a little bit worried about her staying in the trip and wanted to kind of stretch that stamina as much as they possibly could. I also think it ended up ultimately benefiting her that she was so far back because in the Oaks they had very fast middle fractures in there that she was unable to close into. So I think she's a nice horse on her day, but maybe ultimately we'll find a home a little bit more around a mile, which is why I'm not using her here. Wonder Gal, I agree with your assessment that she's, she's the best horse in America not to be a great stakes winner. It really is crazy that she hasn't won one yet. Um, but I do think if she doesn't win here, at some point you, you wonder if it'll if it's gonna happen. Yeah, and they could just drop her back to the test. I wouldn't I mean if uh, I think they're gonna give her another shot. She's definitely worth a lot more if she wins at nine furlongs. Uh, I just think these are so evenly matched. Yes. Um, I want some of the lighter raced ones. And and I think include Betty is really going to be overplayed a lot off that last race. Um, there was a reason why they wanted to stay in some of the minor spots. She's definitely got the distance breeding. But I saw that last race just as a pace meltdown, and, and I don't see that this time. Yeah, I mean, I definitely thought that as well. But I think when you put some of her races together, like that one was a pace meltdown. But then the race before, it was completely opposite scenario. She ran a very good second there as well, so I don't think that she's a horse who particularly needs a complete meltdown to win the race. Um, just based on, you know, looking at her full profile instead of isolating just one race that she's ever ran in. If she has any sort of trouble in here, perhaps it will come into the pace. I don't know how fast they're really going to go. Wonder Girl has some speed. 
I'm a chatterbox if they put her forward SV, but I'm not so sure that they will. Um, so there, there really isn't a lot of speed here. We could, you know, ultimately end up seeing a pretty bunched up field and kind of who just has that best closing kick going home. And if that's what happens, I think that favors include Betty. So it's a little strange, I think, sometimes to say that a, a you know a closing type could be favored in a race with a slow pace, but if it becomes a sit and sprint, I think she's very, very dangerous. Yeah, I fully see a bunched up turn with five, six horses kind of jumbled. I do think the fractions will be on the slow side. Um, I think they're going to let Keen Pauline take him as long as they, you know, this time they'll stay a little bit more wary of her, but we don't know how the track's going to play as well either. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, you can't make total predictions, but I expect a slow pace and I expect Keen Pauline to come back to the field. And I just think, the riders are going to ride a little bit more tactically in this race. This is a big race to win. So I, I just think they're all going to hang and then try to, like you say, make it just become a sprint to the wire. And whoever ultimately gets the best trip on that kind of pace scenario will pick up the victory. Um, and, you know, a few of these horses might just drop back to the test stakes later on this meet. So that race is Sunday afternoon. The Diana and the uh, Stanford is Saturday. And that's going to do it for another edition of Down to the Wire.